came forth from you, O the blessed and perfect, to save the world which he has created according to his mercy. Held to you full of grace, held to you as firm grace, held to you as given birth to Christ the Lord is with you. Nem garchen ni no titoni emmo kep soin sen sok bejviri emmi et iren hanejviri. You revealed your power to the... In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. We will continue our uh, reflections on the book of Psalms. Now actually we are in Psalm... Uh, chapter 5, Psalm 5. So, this psalm is titled To the Chief Musicians with Flutes. The Psalm 4, it was with a stringed instrument, but here with flutes, a psalm of David. That's the title of the psalm. So the title of the psalm indicates that it was directed toward the chief musicians. Some church father said that the chief musician is the Lord Jesus Christ. Actually, we are like strings in the harp of the church, and through his love, he actually harmonized all of us together. And others suppose that the chief musician is the leader of choirs, or musicians in David's time, like Heman, the singer, or Asaph. The psalm was probably intended to be sung with an accompaniment of wind instrument, not stringed instrument like Psalm 4, with wind instrument such as the horn, the trumpet, or flute. It shows David coming to the Lord in the morning. Psalm 4 was evening. Here it's in the morning, as we will see in the words. And receiving the strength and joy he needs to make it through the day against many adversaries. That's why the church put the psalm in the first hour of the Agbeya. And it is very powerful when you wake up in the morning and you pray the psalm, you get the grace you need it, you get the power, you get the strength you need it in order to uh, face all the challenges of the day. So this psalm is a morning psalm. The psalms, as we have seen in the first four psalms, makes a distinction between himself made righteous by the grace of God and the wicked who opposed him, like Absalom his son, like Achitophel the counselor. Some of the church fathers believe that David in this psalm turns his attention to Ahithophel, the wicked counselor or the wicked advisor to Absalom, who betrayed David just as Judas Iscariot betrayed the Lord Jesus Christ. The title according to the Septuagint translation, for her who receives the inheritance. So who is she? This refers to church, the bride of Christ, who receives her inheritance, the internal life, through her bridegroom, our Lord Jesus Christ. So this psalm is for the Holy Church of God, not only for David. And when we pray it, we pray it in our own words, in our own circumstances, in our own conditions. So when we pray it, we should not think about David and his enemies, Absalom and, and Ahithophel. No, we should pray it in our own words, and our enemies are Satan and all the uh, temptation of the world. This psalm is uh, 12 verses, and we can divide it into five sections. From verse 1 to 3, morning supplication to the Lord. From verse 4 to 6, the evil does not please God. 
from 7 to 8 the righteous worship God from 8 to 9 sorry from 9 to 10 God's judgment on the wicked and the last two verses 11 and 12 God's blessings for the righteous so let's start reading from verse 1 give ear to my words O Lord, consider my meditation. Give heed to the voice of my cry, my King and my God, for to you I will pray. My voice you shall hear in the morning, O Lord. In the morning I will direct it to you and I will look up. So these are the first three verses Morning supplication to the Lord. So, when David said, Give ear to my words, O Lord, consider my meditation, we can see here how David is longing for a dialogue with God, not monologue, not just he speaks. He wants to speak, and God listens, and God answers, so he is longing for a dialogue with God. And I want you to Notice that he repeated the same idea three times in the first two verses. Give ear, number one. Consider my meditation, number two. Give heed to my voice, number three. So this repetition, as if he is saying, God, please listen to me. David prayed that God would be attentive to his prayer. This form of the petition is he would that God would attend to his words, to what he's about to express. So he's saying, please God, be attentive to my word. Listen to what I want to say right now. And in verse one, verse one, he said, my words and my meditation. Give ear to my words, O Lord, consider my meditation. Because words and, and prayer, prayer and meditation should go together hand in hand. Uh, what is the difference between words and meditation? Words are the words we utter with our mouth. But meditations are the desires of soul which no language could convey. They are deep unspoken groanings as St. Paul spoke in uh, Romans chapter 8 the groaning St. Augustine described the meditation he said the psalmists will show what this cry is within from the chamber of the heart, without the body utterness, it reaches unto God. So certain cries from the heart reaches to God. So the bodily voice is heard, but the spiritual groaning is understood. The bodily voice is heard. God, hear my prayer. But the spiritual groaning or meditation in, un, is understood. And he said here, cry, give heed to the voice of my cry. Cry is not screaming, but cry denotes intensity and passion of affection. And such powerful, passionate prayers of the righteous can comfort much and do wonders, as St. James said. The prayer of a righteous man avails much. Though David himself was king, yet he acknowledged his subjection to God as his supreme ruler. So, by saying, my king and my God, He's calling God my king and my God. 
Yes, I am King David, but you are the king of all the kings. And by calling him my king and my God, he acknowledged his submission to God as his supreme ruler. And he looked up to God to protect him in his dangers and to restore him to his rights because he was chased from his kingdom, ran away from his son Absalom. So ask God to restore him. So God is his king, but at the same time he is his God to whom he felt that he was permitted to come in the hour of trouble. You are my God, you are my king and my God. My king, I will follow your constitution, your rules, your commandments. And my God, I can come to you in the time of trouble and hardship. To him alone, he will direct all his prayers because he is his God. And therefore, from him alone, he expects support and relief. For to you, I will pray. To you only, I will pray. I'm not asking help from anybody else. You are my God. And David made it a point to pray in the morning. The first thing he does is to pray to God. He neither neglect nor delay that work. It's very, morning prayer is very important. And I hope we spend the time in morning prayer. You get the grace that you need for the whole day. You get the manna that you will rely on the whole day. That's why he said, my voice you shall hear in the morning, O Lord. Every morning you will hear my voice. In the morning, I will direct my voice to you and I will look up. On Simus of Jerusalem states that the psalmist here refers by the word morning to Christian worship versus Jewish worship. For the Jews who were under the shadow of the law used to celebrate the Basque in the evening. Now as the Son of Righteousness, our Lord Jesus Christ, shines through the incarnation, we worship him in the morning, illuminated by his divine rays, not in the evening. We can say that the new Pasch of or the Christian Pasch has been worship, I mean, has been realized in the morning by the resurrection of our Savior, who conquers death and destroys the power of the devil. That's why when we start the, the liturgical day, start at the evening and end the morning. For example, now is considered the eve of Sunday. And all the prayers that started from now is preparing for the liturgy in the morning. So the ultimate worship is in the morning. David prayed in the morning because he wanted to honor God at the beginning of his day. As St. John said, in the beginning was the word. So in the beginning of every day should be God. And this sets the tone for an entire day dedicated to God. If you start your day with God, then the whole day is dedicated with God. All our prayers must be directed to God. And here David teaches us what to do before prayer and after prayer. Before we pray, we should direct our prayer to God. For to you I pray. And after pray, we look up with expectancy to heaven, really believing that God will answer. That's why he said, I will direct it to you and I will look up. I will direct it to you before prayer. I'm directing my prayer to you. And I will look up. I will wait for your answer, for your reply with confidence and faith. So prayer that have the right purpose will have prompt answer. Prayers that have a right purpose will have a prompt answer. 
And he who sends up his petitions to God through Jesus Christ, we pray to God the Father through Jesus Christ by the Holy Spirit. Again, we speak to God the Father in Jesus Christ by the Holy Spirit. So he who sends up his petitions to God through Jesus Christ by the Holy Spirit from a warm, affectionate heart may confid con confidently look up for an answer for it will come. The answer will come. But please notice, if an immediate answer is not given, let not the upright heart assume or believe that the prayer is not heard. God will answer in the fullness of time. So our prayers has found its way to the throne of God. And we must wait patiently to God's guidance. We lose much of the comfort of our prayer because of the desire of seeing their immediate and instant returns. So we pray, and if we did not get an instant answer, we lose the comfort of our prayer. Then from verse 4 to 6, For you are not a God who takes pleasure in wickedness, nor shall evil dwell with you. So here is saying God does not please, evil, sorry, evil does not please God. The psalmist here refers to a well-known and a well-understood characteristic of God. God is holy and pure. God could not have any pleasure in helping the plans of wicked men because light has no fellowship with darkness. Evil men will not obtain any support from God because God is all holy. As David drew closer to God, he became more aware of God's holiness and in the same time of man's sinfulness. God will listen to the prayer of a righteous man since God does not delight in wickedness, but he delights in goodness. He will not be a friend of an unrighteous man they will by no means attempt to ask God's help. He said, nor shall evil dwell with you. So there is no friendship between God and evil people. Verse 5, he said, the boastful shall not stand in your sight. You hate all workers of iniquity. David was encouraged because he was conscious that his own prayer's purpose was right and that his heart was just and that God could not favor the heart of ungodly. He knows that he walks according to the commandment of God. So he referred to his enemies, the boastful. What drives a person away from God? Pride. That's why he called them the boastful. Wicked men referring still to his enemies as having this character. Pride. God should hear him and deliver him because of their character of wickedness. So he is saying, you God, my enemies are boastful, so they will not stand in your sight. You hate all workers of iniquities, so I trust you will hear me because of the character of my enemies. They are indeed foolish, unwise, and irrational in that they oppose and fight against God who is omnipotent and willingly expose themselves to such dreadful sorrows of the everlasting punishment of God by opposing God and rebelling against him. Then he said, you hate all the workers of iniquity. 
maybe we need to stop here about hate. The word hate. Who are the workers of iniquities? Not all that have sin in them or do sin. Because all of us are sinners and no one is without sin. But the workers of iniquity are those who give themselves up to the work of wickedness and they are slaves to it and they are not living the life of repentance. God hates the sin, not the sinners. Sin is foolish and the sinners are the greatest of all fools. But they are fools not because God made them this way. For he does not hate that he has made or created. God does not hate whom he created or whom he made. But they are fools of their own making. God created them in his image after his likeness. But they became fools because they rebelled against God. And that's why he said, you hate all workers of iniquity. Verse 6, you shall destroy those who speak falsehood. The Lord abhors the bloodthirsty and deceitful man. You shall destroy because God will not approve their purpose, the purpose of the wicked. He will not give them prosperity. Then, as a consequence of this, they will be overthrown and punished. He mentioned here especially two people, the Lord, two groups of people. The Lord abhors the bloodthirsty, the murderers, and the deceitful man, the liars. Liars and murderers are in a particular manner said to resemble the devil and to be his children. In the, in the scripture, the devil is a liar and father of every liar. And also in the scripture, it's said about the devil, he is a murderer from the beginning. Uh, therefore, it, it is understood and expected that God should abhor the liars and the murderers. And as in previous verses, David refers this as a general characteristic of God, but with an intended reference to his enemies. So he's speaking in general about God, but his intention he's referring to his enemies. He said, you shall destroy those who speak falsehood. Who are those who are speaking falsehood? David's enemies were false, traitors, unfaithful. And this refers to the rebellion of Absalom. How Absalom sat at the gate of Jerusalem and deceived the people. That's liar. And then he was planning to kill even his father, David. So a liar and a murderer. And he deceives the people by the falsehood. Again, the reference here, to you destroy those who speak falsehood, is to a general characteristic of God. But again, with a special reference to the character of David's enemies. These were the characteristic of David's enemies, and such are still the characteristic of the enemies of Christ and the enemies of the church. David was confident that he had no bad intention and was sure that his enemies were engaged in a wicked plan and purpose. So when he said this about his enemies, not because he hates them or he wants to revenge from them, but because they involved themselves in wicked plan and purpose. So he felt that he might go and pray before God and seek the intervention of God 
with assurance that all his attributes, the attributes of God as a righteous and holy God will be on his side. So when he said, you hate the workers of evil, you abhor the liars and the murderers. So he is comforting himself. If God has this characteristic, then God is on my side. Because my enemies are exactly the opposite of what God actually approves. God has no attribute which can take part with a sinner or on which sinner can rely. But the righteous man can appeal to every attribute in the divine nature with confidence and hope. Verse 7, But as for me, I will come into your house in the multitude of your mercy. In fear of you, I will worship toward your holy temple. My enemies are opponent to you, but as for me, I enter your house relying on your mercies, not relying on my righteousness. And I'm here, I worship you toward your holy temple. So this was David's confidence. It wasn't that he thought he was righteous and his enemies are sinners. No. The reason of his confidence was the mercy of God. The mercies of God. As he said, but as for me, I will come into your house in the multitude of your mercies. St. John Chrysostom said, since the church has been gathered together out of such people, who are we? Our background, some of us pagan, soothsayers, murderers, sorcerers, liars, cheats. So the church said, you hate and abhor, indicating that it was not due to her righteousness and good deeds, but to God's loving kindness that she had been rescued from them and let into uh, the precincts. So we are here in the church worshiping God, not because of our righteousness, because we are sinners. We are murderers, liars, soothsayers, adulterers, etc. But we are here in the church because of his mercy. But as for me, I will come into your house in the multitude of your mercies. There are some who do not welcome his mercy as the Jews were. This in the court of St. John Chrysostom. Like Mary of Egypt, she wanted to enter the church, she couldn't. But then, according to the multitude of his mercies, he allowed her to enter the church. That's why you enter in fear of you, in reverence, properly considering the infinite holiness of his majesty. So when we enter the church, we walk in fear and reverence, befitting the majesty of God. David bows and prostrates himself in the deepest self-denial and humility. I worship toward your holy temple. Then he said in verse 8, Lead me, O Lord, in your righteousness. My enemies are plenty. I don't know how to handle them. I'm coming here. I have no wisdom. I'm coming here asking to lead me, O Lord, in your righteousness because of my enemies. Make your way straight before my face. Make your way straight before my face. So the main object and central thought of the psalm is the prayer of guidance. You remember in verse 1 and 2, hear my prayer, attentive to, be attentive to me. Why he was pushing this, what he is asking from God, here is the prayer, lead me, lead me, O Lord. So here we know what he was praying for. He is asking to direct his heart, his thoughts, his deeds, asking God to direct his heart, thought, and deeds, and all the course and action of his life, especially because of his enemies, how to deal with them. St. Jerome said the 
my enemies here, not just enemies, but those lying in ambush. They want to take my soul, to kill me. So God's guidance and protection would enable the good man to avoid their traps and to walk straight in the way of righteousness. That's why he told him, make your way straight before my face. Uh, so to walk in God's way is to walk in safety. In safety. If I walk in the valley of shallow or death, I will fear nothing because you are with me. And here he did not say, uh, make your way is uh, make your way smooth before me. He did not say make it leveled or easy. But he said, make your way straight. Put it plainly before me that I may clearly discern it and see it and walk in it. Make it clear before me. Then verse 9, he returned back to speak about his enemies. And he said, for there is no faithfulness in their mouth. Their inward part is destruction. Their throat is an open tomb. They flatter with their tongue. So, our righteousness or wickedness will sooner or later show up in our speech. Our language, our words will reveal who we are. As the Lord said, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So David felt the wound of wicked words and lies against him. His enemies speak one thing, but they mean another. No sincerity. And under a false act of kindness, they seek his destruction. They speak uh, kind words in order to trap him, to capture him, to destroy him. There is no faithfulness in their mouth. Their inward part, their intention is destruction. They want to destroy me. And their throat is an open tomb. They flatter with their tongue. So, they are deceitful and unfaithful. That's why he, the only thing he can do is to appeal to God for direction. Here he is re re referring to the rebellion of Absalom. Absalom had gone to Hebron on a false claim, and every act of his in this whole matter had been disloyal and deceitful. Not only their external conduct, but their heart and their motives were bad, were wicked, destructions, you want to kill him. Then he said, their throat is an open tomb. The throat of wicked men may be compared for a tomb. Tomb is hungry and thirsty and greedy for dead people and never has enough or never is satisfied. In the same way, they are hungry to murder people and do character assassination. So this is true of the throat. Whether it be considered as an instrument of, of speech, because the throat is an instrument of speech and an instrument of swallowing. So as a speech, they threw out damaging word to the character and reputation of others. They kill people with their words, like the tomb, character assassination. Or the throat is an instrument of swallowing meat and drink, where the pleasure of appetite is. So maybe when he said their throat is open tomb, expressive of the eager desire of the wicked after sin. As the Bible says, they drink up iniquity like water, and of their delight in it, in the sin, 
and their fullness of it and yet still hungry, desirous, and not to be satisfied. He who drinks from this water, the salt water of the world, will never be satisfied. Also, their throat is open to for the bad odor it releases. Immortality, foolish talking, proceeding out of it, curses, insult, blasphemies coming out through the throat. That's why if the throat is like open tomb, the danger is that into it men may fall unaware. It's a trap. Especially if they are using deceitful words. Because evil communication of the wicked men corrupt good manners. Evil company corrupt good morals and do great harm and misleading to those who fall into company with them. Uh, they flatter with their tongue. They pretend friendship that they may more easily deceive and destroy. Like Judas, he greeted the master, kissed him, you know, so they flattered with their tongue. Also, these are prophecies about Judas. So the tongue, instead of confessing the truth, it was employed to flatter others. Why? With a view to lead them astray, to trap them. It fits what Absalom and his followers did. It's also a characteristic to the wicked in general. That's why in verse 10 he said, Pronounce them guilty, O God. Let them fall by their own counsels. Cast them out in the multitude of their transgressions, for they have rebelled against you. Pronounce them guilty, O God. David desired, since they were undoubtedly guilty, that God would regard and treat them as such. It is not that he wished that God would make them guilty. He did not say, God, make them guilty. But they are already guilty. And they were pursuing a course which tended to overthrow the rule of the land, the kingdom of David. And as they were at war with God, as he said, for they have rebelled against you. So the rebellion is against God because David was appointed by God and anointed as a king by God. That's why it is for the best interest of the people, God would interrupt and stop the, their progress and pronounce them guilty. And here God would show himself to be a righteous and just God. You cannot, we cannot say, see here any evidence of revenge. It's a prayer which corresponds with all the efforts and consequently with all the wishes of every good person. Until now when we see like the terrorists are killing Christian, innocent Christian, we pray, pronounce them guilty of, of the Lord that the violator of the law may be stopped and punished. St. Augustine said, also it is a prophecy, not a curse. When he said pronounce them guilty, it's a prophecy, not a curse. For he does not wish that it should come to pass, but he perceives what will come to pass. So David is saying this, what will happen as a prophecy, not as a desire in his heart that they will be destroyed. For this happens to them not because he appears to have wished for, wished for it, but because they are such as to deserve that it should happen. So it's a prophecy, not a curse. Let them fall by their own counsel. So, David assumed that God will make his enemies fall. 
So he's praying here that they may fall from the effect of their own counsel. Why? St. Augustine believed that the meaning here is that it was a wish for their good. Because when they fall by their own counsel, they know that their counsel is not successful, then they will repent and return back to God. So when David said, destroy or let them fall by their own counsel, it is a prayer for, the, for their good, so they may no more think evil. When I, I, I find out that the evil counsel destroyed me or make me fall, I will repent. So the psalmist did not wish to be made the means of their destruction. He, he didn't say to God, please let me destroy them. Give me the power to destroy them. No, he did not pray. But he desired that God would himself interrupt so that their own plans might be the means of defeating the rebellions by their own plans. And this is exactly what happened. The rebellion was defeated by the council of Ahithophel. If men are so wicked that they must perish, it is more desirable that it should be seen that they perish by their own guilt, their own imprudence, their own counsel, not through others. And the fate of Ahithophel, who gives the bad counsel, fulfills this imperfection. Then he said, cast, cast them out in the multitude of their transgression. Cast them out. Let them not be successful in taking position of the throne and in overturning the regime. This he wishes to happen as a consequence of the number and aggravation of their offenses. The psalmist wanted to focus the attention on the great number of their sins as a reason why they should not be successful because of the many offenses and the aggravation of the offenses. So such a prayer is not wrong for it would not be right to pray that the sinners in the abundance of their sin or in the consequence of the multitude of their sin be successful and prosperous should not pray for the prosperity of, of the sinners and for their success. Then, I like the, how he ended verse 10, for they have rebelled against you. And here, he stated the reason why they should be cast out. For they have rebelled against you. It was, it was not that David they did David wrong. So there is no revenge here. It's not personal here. It was because they had rebelled against God. So it was very right, therefore, to hope, to hope and pray that God may interfere. So there is no spirit of revenge manifested here and nothing said that would encourage such spirit. David prayed that the wicked would come to their deserved end. As rebels against God, they deserved the guilty sentence. Then the last two verses in this psalm, verse 11, But let all those rejoice who put their trust in you. Let them ever shout for joy because you defend them. Let those also who love your name be joyful in you. David likes contrast. After, in the preceding verse, he spoke about the punishment of the ungodly. Now he is describing the happiness of the righteous. Who would not rely upon God's word and promise when all human hopes and refuge fail? So when all our earthly hopes fail, who would not rely on God? 
This was often the case of David and his followers. David did not find anyone to rely on him. That's why he said, don't rely on princes of this world. They die and they return back to the dust. Blessed is he who put his trust in God of Jacob. The wicked have everything to dread, for they must be cut off. But the righteous, on the other hand, have every reason to be happy, for they shall be blessed and protected by God. So we, the children of God, we should be happy and rejoice and be joyful always. The righteous are not made righteous by their own words, but by the mercies of God. The righteous are those who trust the Lord and love his name. So how to become righteous? Trust God, love his name. That's why he said, Put their trust in you, let those also who love your name. Their righteousness is evident in their words. They rejoice. They shout for joy. They are joyful in the Lord. He repeated it three times. Joy is one of the fruit of the Holy Spirit and one of the characteristic of the truly godly that they do find their happiness in God. When the apostles were tortured, they returned joyfully because they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. St. Paul rejoiced when exposed to distress. He was on the point of death and he spoke of sharers in his enjoyment. He said, yes, and if I am being poured out as a drink offering on the sacrifice and service of your faith, that's his suffering. I am glad and rejoice with you all. For the same reason, you also be glad and rejoice with me. St. Paul also said, rejoice always, pray without ceasing. And Philippi, he said, rejoice in the Lord always. And Jesus indicated this in his words, revealing the lasting and continue, continuing of the enjoyment. I will see you again. Your heart will rejoice and your joy no one will take from you. No one will take your joy from you. So be joyful in you, David is saying, in your existence, in your perfection, in your power, in your authority, in your word, in your law, in your commandments. In all that you have revealed of yourself, we are joyful in what you revealed to us, O oh God, in all that you do for us. We rejoice that there is God, and this God is a merciful and a just God. The righteous delight in communion with God and in doing his will. Last verse. For you, O Lord, will bless the righteous. With favor you will surround him as with a shield. With favor, you will surround him as a shield. Favor means grace. So this is the greatest blessing of all, the favor of God. Knowing that God looks on us with favor and pleasure is the greatest knowledge in the world. God is pleased with me, and he will grant me his grace. God is pleased with me. All the joy of, of the righteous comes from the fact that God's blessing is upon them. You will bless the righteous with favor. You will surround him as with shield. You will surround him as with a shield. A shield in a war guards only one side. But the favor of God is to the saint a defense on every side. The shield cannot the back but the favor of God defend you from every side that's why he said with favor you will surround him surround him so the believers are promised total defense which they need 
in this land of battles in the fullest measure. So while the believers keep themselves under the divine protection, they are entirely safe and ought to be entirely satisfied. In another translation that we pray in the Agbaya, which is taken from the Coptic text, this verse read, as a shield of favor you have crowned us, as a shield of favor you have crowned us. God is the godly man's shield and his crown. So the righteous, their shield is God and their crown is God. St. Jerome says, in the world a shield is one thing and a crown is another. But with God, he himself, our shield, our protection, he himself is our crown, both. is our crown and our shield. St. Jerome continues, for our victory is won and the crown of our victory is gained by his protection and through his shield. So by saying my shield and crown because through his protection the shield of grace and favor we are victorious and because we are victorious we are crowned. He shall receive the crown who in this world has proved the conqueror and we conquer through God. This concludes chapter um, verse um, Psalm 5 from Psalms of David. Glory be to God forever and ever. Amen.